Everybody, thanks for, uh, for sticking us out. It's always fun and tough to be the third person on a three-person slate. Uh, you've either failed to exfiltrate the room appropriately, or you're really motivated to hear me talk about terrorism, which I hope is the case, uh, and I hope is true as we, uh, as we go through this morning. So General Lyons, sir, thanks for being here again. Um, I talk about terrorism. Terrorism and STRATCOM, kind of an interesting fit. Uh, we keep this at the unclassified level, so you can talk about these things at home. You can talk about them in the hallways. The class that Dr. Springer and I teach at Air Command and Staff College, we keep at the same level just because the more people who are exposed to different ideas about terrorism, who can debunk what you hear on CNN, to think a little bit more deeply about what you hear on MSNBC or Fox News or read in The Economist, you know, the Times of London, whatever paper that you, uh, you choose to receive your information from, the better off we are, the better off we are having this conversation about something that has shaped the Department of Defense and our response to, uh, to the world, honestly, for the last 17 years. Uh, when we take this presentation out to the GCCs, you take this to CENTCOM, you take this to UCOM, this is a fight that we think about on a daily basis. STRATCOM, maybe you don't think about it as often as some of our partners do, but you're confronted with this every day. Uh, in the introduction that, uh, that uh, Dr. Pavlik was going to deliver, he was going to mention that I'm an intel guy by trade. Um, I spent the first half of my career in intelligence figuring out how to blow people up. I spent the last 12 years of my career as an academic and as an intel professional thinking, maybe that's not the best thing we need to be doing in terms of our approaches to national defense. Don't know how well that will play with STRATCOM as an audience. Uh, we'll see how things go in the Q&A when I'm done. Um, if you're going to take, well, studying terrorism, this is one of you, you know, this was a gold mine. This was a nugget. Uh, I was working on a dissertation studying suicide bombing, which makes me automatically the most happy and well-adjusted person in the room. And this came across my, uh, my news feed in February. Suicide bomb trainer in Iraq accidentally blows up his class. The Germans have a term for this. That term would be schadenfreude the joy that comes in seeing the suffering of others. And if you go into the article, great story. Uh, somewhere north of, of Baghdad, Islamic State trainer is demoing how to conduct suicide bombing operations to his class. Roughly 20 to 30 people sitting in the audience, eager to soak up this knowledge, fails to safe his vest, doesn't realize he actually has live rounds strapped to his chest, puts his hand out, hits the switch, and boom. If you read the rest of the article, hilarity ensues amongst the local Iraqi population. Hey, this guy's dead, those morons, how could they be so stupid? They had this coming to them. And it winds up in the New York Times so people like me can find it. And it gets a couple laughs, it was on Fox, it was in some other news networks. So stop and think about what this means for a second, once the, once the dark humor subsides. So there's an organization that's actually conducting classes for an, an atrocious and horrific form of violence. This isn't one or two people showing up. This is an audience. Okay, if you have 20 prospective suicide bombers sitting in the crowd, that's 20 human rounds that you're going to expend downrange, marching into marketplaces, hospitals, police checkpoints, detonating themselves. They're not all Iraqis. So to get those 20 people into Baqaba, which is north of Iraq, they had to come through Syria. They had to come through Turkey. They had to come through other ports and other places, which means then you have a network that is capable of attracting and recruiting people like this. This is a class. How many more are coming in? And I don't want to put, make this too scary about the suicide bombing aspect, because you can extend this to other problems and other issues that we see in terror the number of people who are coming in to be fighters. Hey, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to blow myself up, but I want to do something on the battlefield. Okay, organization X has a spot for you. I want to be a cook. Okay, the Islamic State actually recruited for bread makers in Mosul. You see advertisements in some of their house magazines, um, Dabiq and then Rumiya. You see advertisements for clerical positions. You see advertisements for power generators, for doctors. All of this becomes a question of resource mobilization. All of this is to say in terms of a buildup, I would submit, as Dr. Springer and Dr. Pavlik have, have shown, militarily and technologically, the United States military is capable of pretty much finding 
in prosecuting violence anywhere on the planet against any target we can find. We are good at it. Okay, STRATCOM has had 70 years of targeting experience in, in various incarnations, okay? Our intelligence capabilities in terms of remotely piloted vehicles, in terms of overhead assets, national assets, we are really, really good at this. I grew up in the intelligence transition in the Air Force over to Predators, Reapers. Talking to my brothers and sisters who are doing that, the stuff that we do is amazing on a daily basis. It is jaw-dropping from where we were in 1999 to where we are now in terms of an ISR and a PED enterprise. Uh, but what I'm going to submit today, what I'm going to say is that because we're really good at finding and killing people, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily get us any closer to where we want to be in a security environment. So while we can talk about finding and hunting individuals, because that's cool, what I'm going to suggest is that we need to be thinking organizationally about terrorist organizations, terrorist groups as organizational entities that live, exist, have requirements to actually prosecute their mission and try to advance their agenda. So that's where this, is, this presentation is going to go today. When we talk about terror, yeah, it's not going away. From 1998 to 2017, over 100,000 terror incidents. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the 2012 to 2017, 2017 spectrum, about 60,000 of them have been the last five years. This is not something that is going away, despite our best efforts to the contrary. Because I'm an academic, we've got to have a thesis statement. So we've already talked about one, we're really good at finding and, and prosecuting targets, and that's not getting us where we need to be. So this is where I want to take this argument. So terrorist actors are political contestants. There is some sort of end that they want to achieve. They want to achieve or claim political power, and we'll talk about what that looks like. Terror is a choice. Okay, You have a range of options available to you as an organization. Terror is one of many choices that groups can take to claim for that political power, and they do two things with it. The first is, is that they want to achieve some kind of political goal. Caliphate now. Independent homeland now. Change your policy towards the occupation in country X. You kids better behave. Okay, these are political goals. The second one, and the tack that I take towards this, is looking at is it organizational survival. What good is it to win if you are not around to enjoy the benefits of your struggle. I like to think that's kind of plays to a Stratcom audience with the type of things and the deterrence issues that we are studying, okay? There's a targeting component, there is also a national survival component. Terrorists are operating thinking about this organizational survival component. Look, it's, it, it's great to say we want a caliphate. Who gets to be the caliph? Presumably us. You know, we spent all of this time, all of this effort, all of this manpower to do this, we want to enjoy the benefits of our labor and create the world, create the environment that caused us to engage in struggle in the first place. Because it, I do have a PME background and an Intel background, of course, there's an overview slide with my four obligatory main points. Why terror? Think about some frameworks. What terrorists want? I don't think we think about that enough in the news. And then finally, where I see terror going in the future. So there's a lot of different things you can do to contest for political power on the nonviolent or the violent end of the spectrum. You're a group that feels underrepresented. You want to get your point across. What do you do? You send tweets. Go out into the Twitter sphere, put something out there. Engage in hacktivism. Maybe deface a website. Create a website that points to, to express your agenda, your goals. Uh, hey, you can vote. How radical an idea actually participating in regular political processes. Sometimes those don't work, and we see groups and organizations move into the violent end of the spectrum. You can see things like assassination, riots, sabotage, insurgency, all the way up to civil war. Terrorism is this odd duck that sort of occupies a lot of different spaces in relation to those things. I mentioned claims on political power, and, and Dr. Pavlik um, addressed this earlier. There's one school of thought that says groups actually participate in terrorism because they want to get rich. Or if not get rich, they want their share of what they perceive to be spoils, political goods, public goods, and an environment. This is the greed theory. Um, and it's not like the Gordon Gecko greed theory from Wall Street, if some of you can remember back to that Michael Douglas film uh, with all, or directed by Oliver Stone. It is literally there is a pot of spoils or a pot of things that we want to actually be able to take advantage of. 
So that's greed. But the other one, the other cause, uh, broad cause range is grievance. Looking around the environment in the political process, thinking that there is something wrong and some sort of need needs to be addressed. My minority group in Myanmar is not properly represented in the political process. I'm a Tamil growing up in Sri Lanka, and the Sinhala government is excluding me from access to government facilities, to universities, to participation. And you get a group like the Liberation Tigers of Tamil, Elam. Um, if you are in Northern Ireland, there is a religious difference. And uh, one group feels that they are excluded from full participation in the full rights of, of Commonwealth citizenry. So they can form a group like the Irish Republican Army. And you see struggles that are going on. You're going back to the troubles through the Easter Rising of 1916, even through to today. Although today's IRA is a different kind of cat than uh, the IRA from the 1960s and 1970s. So we have greed and grievance as motivators for political action. When we think about terrorist groups, they don't usually just sit there and say, we're doing this for ourselves. They represent a broader group. There's usually religious or ethnic affiliations with these. Okay? If you look at the Islamic State, they have a very distinct view of the role of the Shia in Iraq and Iran um, against their, their Sunni, majority or Sunni minority within their countries. Okay? They're not like us. This is a group that we identify with, and we are taking action on behalf of that group. They also have audiences. And one of the biggest things that we see in terms of the future of terrorism is the globalization of these audiences. Okay, if you're familiar with the Somali exodus um, in the 1990s and early 2000s, a lot of them, a lot of Somali expatriates wound up in Minneapolis, St. Paul for various reasons, including the, the, the churches there were willing to take them in and give them a new start in the United States. We fast forward, we see cases of Somalis executing mall attacks or Somali teenagers, adolescents who have grown up in the United States, going back to Somalia to fight for Al-Shabaab. Uh, I'm from, originally from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Dr. Spring and I were back to Detroit a couple years ago. Um, my grandma, my, my family still lives there. And we were amazed that, one, you could walk into a Tim Hortons, because Tim Hortons is awesome, and we love Tim Hortons donuts. But walking into this Tim Hortons in, uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, the population of customers exclusively spoke Arabic. Okay? Dearborn has one of the largest Palestinian uh, populations in the world outside of the Middle East. Okay? You see cases of support and resources flowing out of there back to causes that you would see affiliated with Hamas or Hezbollah um, within the, the, the Palestinian territories. In terms of this representation, we also see uh, it would be incorrect to say that terrorists have delusions of grandeur, or terrorist organizations have delusions of grandeur. But they do see the world in such a way that they are on top at the end. And in some cases, they have mobilized a host of people to come along with them. If, if you're familiar with Abu Musa al-Zarqawi, died in 2006. Street thug from the streets of Zarqa in Jordan, goes through a process of radicalization, travels to Afghanistan, travels to Pakistan, winds up in prison in Jordan, comes back, and actually launches what would turn into the Islamic State. It happens over time, but he has visions of, one, kicking the Jordanian government out of, you know, out of power in Jordan, and then that expanding and turning into something much, much brighter and much bigger for the Sunni Muslim population in Iraq, in Jordan, and around the world. Then finally, Terrorists are in a hurry. Organizationally, they're in a hurry. Look, if you could get it through the ballot, you wouldn't need to be terrorists. If you had enough, of, enough appeal to the masses, guess what? You wouldn't need to engage in violence to produce a political end to achieve a political goal. So there's an idea that they use violence to actually jumpstart a conversation, to actually get the ball rolling, to cause people to rally to their cause, or to gather people to their cause, rather than starting slowly and just sort of meandering around lost in the desert. And there's always an element of when do we want it? Now. If not now, soon. Okay. If you're familiar with, and I, and I would hope you are, you've read the national military strategy, national security strategies um, of the United States. 
Look, are we on 2 plus 3 now? Because we were on 4 plus 1, which was the big 4 plus violent extremism. Uh, now we're on 2 plus 3. Violent extremism is like those, those, those weird, you know, the weird cousins in the corner. So there's the state threat, and then there's these guys. Um, interestingly enough, the United States doesn't really go out of its way to define violent extremism. We define countering violent extremism quite frequently. But VE, encouraging, condoning, justifying, supporting commission of a violent act to achieve political, ideological, religious, social, or economic goals. Yeah, that's actually from USAID. That's not from the State Department. That's not from a security strategy. That's from the, the, the foreign aid folks. Um, and then this is the definition of terrorism that I am operating under. Uh, this comes from Bruce Hoffman. No relation. Just a very popular last name. I hear Hoffman is big in Germany. Um, deliberate creation and exploitation of fear through violence or threat of violence by a non-state actor. And as I mentioned previously, look, we're talking about political change, but we're also talking about audiences beyond the immediate realm of an attack, okay? Blowing up a marketplace in Iraq is horrific. School shootings in Beslan are horrific. Knocking over a police station in, in Borno State in Nigeria kidnapping hundreds of girls from, from the Chai Bok School, these things are horrific. And they have a terrible effect on the immediate audience, the immediate victims of the attack. However, terrorists are actually trying to influence an audience far beyond the immediate victims of the attack. Think about the globalization of the media cycle now. Okay, if something happens in a marketplace in Baghdad, we're going to know about it in the United States pretty quickly. Maybe Sky News picks it up, somebody else picks it up, AFP, you know, pick your media source. The globalization and the interconnectedness that we see today through things like Twitter, through Telegram, through YouTube, uh, in addition to what you would recognize as more common or traditional terrestrial uh, broadcast media, these things allow attacks to play out not just in real time locally but around the world. And this audience, this attempt to uh, to show what's going on, to declare action on behalf of a cause, this is very important in mobilizing the resources that terrorist organizations need to survive. Have that removed. Because I'm a political scientist, I love triangles. I will not talk about Clausewitz. Clausewitz had enough triangles. This is a triangle that I've adopted from other places. When I like to think about terrorism in terms of frameworks, we like to think of it broadly speaking as first, individuals. Mentioned that previously, we're really good at finding them. We investigate radical, radicalization. We investigate why individuals choose to participate. Secondly, we need to think about the environment. You need to think about the culture and society that these organizations operate from. Okay? Some groups use suicide bombing. Many, many more groups do not use suicide bombing. Why is that? What about their culture? What about their society? What about the environment makes some methods of political contestation acceptable and some others not acceptable? And then finally, we think about it from the organizational aspect. We think about it in terms of goal attainment, you know, the what is it the terrorists want. And we also think about it in terms of group survival because, again, if you get it and you're not around to enjoy it, why bother? So what do terrorist groups want? Andrew Kidd and Barbara Walter wrote an article called The Strategies of Terrorism in 2006. That's a different Barbara Walter from the one that you may be thinking of news-wise. And they think about it in terms of five different categories, five typologies. Okay, first, regime change. Organization wants to take over the political process and the political leadership of an existing territory. Related to that is territorial control. Maybe you don't want to take over the regime. You want to eject the regime from a contested homeland. Maybe you want to cut out you know, territory from an already sovereign nation and claim it as your own. You can think about policy change. When Al Qaeda started off, their main goal was to eject the United States and the West from Saudi Arabia. If you go back and read the writings of Osama bin Laden, Ayman al Zawahiri, these are the things that Al Qaeda is talking about. These things, as we see in the Al Qaeda case, have changed over time. It expands to uh, the destruction of the state of Israel, which would get into the idea of regime change and territorial control. You also see social control, and this is a popular one, especially with the Islamic State. An organization wants to create a society that behaves and acts in a certain way. If you're familiar with what happened in Mosul in northern Iraq, if you're familiar with what happened in uh, eastern Syria, 
You know, the Islamic State implements a series of fines, uh, hadood punishments for what's perceived to be uh, violations of Sharia law to create a state that operates and looks like they think a state should operate. And then finally, in some cases, terrorists want to maintain the status quo. They, they don't want change. They want to maintain society the way it is. They are against the introduction of different elements that, in their views, pollute the way their society should look. Okay. We'll come back to this one towards the end. If those are the goals, let's think about what an organization needs to do to survive. They have to maintain some kind of control. Otherwise, it's just chaos. Okay, this does not mean that every terrorist organization is a, is a hierarchical organization, but it does mean that there is somebody who is in charge and somebody gets to decide how the group is going to operate. At the same time, terrorist organizations that start off as small covert conspiracies that want to exist need to maintain some kind of security. Okay, not everybody can come in. Not everybody is subject to the secrets that the leaders hold. This isn't to say that they have badging systems like we see in this building. Okay, but there is some sort of need for security because, look, if your operatives are getting rolled up all the time, what good are you? So those are the big two. There's always a competition between these two things. But there are other things that the group needs to do as well to survive. Hey, you have to plan operations and you need to execute them. Otherwise, you're a club that has some pretty radical ideas sitting around somebody's basement or sitting in somebody's house, but you're never going anywhere. So you actually have to do things because that's how you advertise. That's how you gain market share. That's how you gain audience by action. You actually need to communicate these things. Look, stuff blowing up, okay, that can send a message, but when you're contesting for political power, or challenging for political power, you need to actually make sure that the violence is on purpose. That the recipients, the intent, or the intended recipients, know why things are blowing up and knowing what your political goals are. Otherwise, you're a shadowy conspiracy that, that, that does some weird things, but nobody knows how to change or what to deal with in the future. Money, and not just money, but also people. The Islamic State needs bread makers. Yeah, it needs fighters too. The Chinese, we or Chinese Uyghurs actually can or make up one of the largest foreign fighter uh, ethnic groups within the Islamic State. Resource, they don't have a lot of money, but they do provide manpower in terms of operations. And again, this also gets towards recruiting. And then finally, hey look, once you have the, once you have the members, you need to retain them. Some of the uh, document exploitation that came out of the Islamic State, and there are a lot of great reports that came out about 2008, 2009 from some documents that were found in the Sinjar region of Iraq, talks about paying fighters. Even though people come in to fight in a terrorist organization, you know, they're attracted by ideals, they're attracted by the goals, that sort of thing, they gotta live too. And there's all kinds of stuff written about pay structures, remuneration structures, for fighters within organizations. And this also goes with, look, you need to maintain and keep the equipment that a group needs to survive. All of these things become inc increasingly important at an organizational level. Individually, we can talk about recruiting, we can talk about money, but you need to consider all of these things because if any of them go away, the group begins to have some, some problems in terms of its organizational longevity, organizational survival. Having grown up as a staff officer, top line coordination was the bane of my existence. Can we get your general to comment on this? Absolutely, we are happy to review this and have the following substantive corrections or comments. So imagine this one. Organizationally, the Islamic State of Iraq in late 2009, early 2010 comes up with a strategic plan. While there weren't PowerPoint slides to accompany it, when you go through and read it, this looks like something that would be produced by any military hierarchy or military bureaucracy. How do we fund? How do we sustain? What are our targets? You know, do we attack the Americans who are leaving? Do we lay low? Do we go to ground? Where do we go? Should we expand? Should we contract? Should we stay in Mosul? Should we try to take over Baghdad? 
These are the hallmarks, the organizational hallmarks, of a group that thinks far beyond just a couple guys running around with rifles doing things. So if you're, you know, if you, if you've, you're starting to fade out, think about terrorist groups at an organizational level. Think beyond the individual. If there's the TLDR there, think about organizations, what organizations need to do to get by for the future, rather than just the people. So what's the future look like? Well, Yogi Berra said something. I turned to my favorite philosophers, Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, who knows? A couple thoughts to conclude. Talked about grievances. There's an old saying that says, all politics is local. Terrorism is local. Terrorism is a response to a local grievance, local resource imbalance, that sort of thing. What has changed, as I mentioned earlier, though, is the nature of transnational actors. Communications technology makes it possible for people to talk and to share ideas, to share tips, tricks, to attract resources. So you can now see an Al-Qaeda franchise, an Al-Qaeda core that's set up somewhere in, in, in Pakistan with affiliates in Afghanistan, but now you have Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in the, on the, in the Indian subcontinent, Al-Qaeda this, Al-Qaeda that. You have groups like Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab declaring fealty to Al-Qaeda, then shifting that to the Islamic State, and then shifting it back to somebody else depending on where the flow of resources can come in. And the point of this is that terrorists talk. People talk. In the 1980s, there was evidence of the IRA training with the PLO. Okay, if you can remember all the way back to the, the Tom Clancy novel, Patriot Games. You know, that was one of the big things in Patriot Games. And while that was fiction, it wasn't too far off the mark in terms of the transnational ties between disparate terrorist organizations. I also mentioned earlier, it's a brave new world out there on the internet. Okay, we have the Islamic State's Telegram channel. We have Boko Haram posting videos on Twitter. Uh, we have the Pakistani Taliban posting their training videos, complete with uh, what looks to be camouflage pants and high white socks. Okay, I guess that's the cutting edge of terrorist chic for the Tariki Taliban in Pakistan. We hear a lot about lone wolves, lone wolf attacks in the United States, okay, and, and we think of these Pulse nightclub. San Bernardino. Uh, you see attacks in Canada, truck attacks in Marseille, knife attacks in, in, in trains in Paris, knife attacks in Hamburg. Okay, this is cool. It's a U-Haul truck. Nice photo of a U-Haul truck. Has the uh, Venture Across America Pennsylvania label on it. Okay, what's actually kind of scary though, Rumia, an affordable weapon. Okay, it's not just 1995 for crosstown moves these days. This is a picture from the Islamic State's house magazine, Rumia, that talks about conducting lone wolf attacks in the United States in Europe. And it has such great advice as, hey, when you're choosing a vehicle to drive into crowds, consider the wheelbase. While it's an affordable weapon, that wheelbase is so far apart, it doesn't actually crush the victims of the attack immediately uh, under the wheels. It gives them time to get away. This is the kind of stuff that is going on in terms of lone wolves and open sources. Okay, when you have open source jihad, when you have open source struggle, the threat window expands far beyond regular places that you would consider. Okay, I don't think there was anybody who saw San Bernardino coming. There was nobody who saw Hassan coming at the Fort Hood shooting. There was nobody that saw Pulse or the Bataclan nightclub in Paris coming. Okay, when you have a central organization that can take advantage of these communication means and advertise, these are the type of things you see. Uh, you also see some nice advice on knife attacks. This is from the next issue of Rumia magazine. Hey, make sure you pick a good knife, not a kitchen knife or a lockback knife because, you know, it may fold on you. These are the types of targets to attack. Additionally, what you see is that there are actors out there who aren't really affiliated with a group that the group will then take credit for after an attack happens. If you look at claiming information out of attacks that, that happened in Iraq from about 2012 to 2017, 
about 10% of them are actually claimed. It's assumed that the Islamic State did most of them, but there are other groups, other actors who are competing for market share, and for various reasons they either claim or don't claim attacks. What this points to is that, look, an event can happen. If you think of the Las Vegas um, shooting, the concert shooting that happened about a year ago, the Islamic State, in some channels, started taking credit for that one. There's no evidence whatsoever that this is the case. However, it creates a, an even more shadowy and even more capable organization when it can claim credit for something and nobody presents information to refute it. Once again, you're advertising the group's reach, the group's capability, its organizational capacity to do things. We can also think about state sponsors, states, sponsors, and quasi-states. This guy, regarded as probably the biggest political, one of the biggest political actors in the Middle East, the head of the, uh, the IRGC Quds Force, Qasim Soleimani. He's been branded a living martyr by the, uh, by the Iranian Ayatollahs because of his influence and his ability to, to look at things. If you look at what's going on in Iraq today, there's all sorts of stuff that the Iranians are doing there, o both overtly and covertly. Uh, think of Iranian influence in Syria, uh, their relationship, say, to Hezbollah. Okay, there's, you know, if, if you're going to do a Venn diagram, there's a nice circle there and then all kinds of things going around in terms of states and non-states overlapping in the terrorist realm. Uh, you can think about al-Shabaab fighters in Somalia trying to carve off part of Somali territory for themselves. It, it's been very interesting this year. We have a Kenyan officer uh, who's been working against al-Shabaab extensively and the insights that he'll bring in in terms of what Al -Shab or what Shabab's trying to do to set up their own state growing out of the Islamic Courts Union in, in 2006, 2007. Okay, so if there's a takeaway, the, the last takeaway, and then we will transition to, uh, to a short break and then Q&A. Look, as an Intel guy, I was a large fan of visually pleasing destruction. I spent 12 years in fighter wings saying, look, this is how we go blow stuff up. Okay, in a variety of countries in support of a variety of operational plans in a variety of theaters. And as I mentioned, you know, we've gotten to be very good at it. This was a picture actually out of Syria, um, or, you know, not, or following a U.S. strike in Syria. And it's impressive. Okay, big billowy clouds, good detonation, you know, blast effects there. What we need to think about, what we need to consider, how does this affect all of these things. Bug hunting, going after the individuals, is cool, and it leads to a lot of amazing stories, and it highlights our capabilities. But does it actually get us any closer to where we need to be nationally, internationally, to affect a security environment? And with that, uh, as I mentioned, let's take five minutes, ten minutes? Okay. We'll take five, ten minutes, convene, come back, and uh, we'll do a Q&A. So thanks for your attention.